So we need you to continue to pray for us. Amen. Tomorrow is my 57th birthday. Amen. I'll be 57 years old tomorrow. Some people, especially in the LGBT community, view that as being ancient. And uh, I'm sure that I'm right up there with the Tyrannosaurus Rex and, you know, that sort of thing. But I'm going to tell you, I have to share this with you. I promised the Lord when He gave me a great miracle back in 2000 that I was going to talk about it and share about it till the day I died. Amen. So people could know what a mighty God we serve. 2000, the year 2000, at this exact day, I was lying in a hospital bed in New Haven, Connecticut, at Yale Haven Hospital, and the doctors had given up all hope. They had no um, hope in the universe that I would survive. Uh, for a month, they told my family that I'd be gone inside of uh, 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 24 hours. And that kept being repeated in their hearing day after day after day for a month. And they kept being told, you know, he'll be gone within 24 hours. He'll be gone within 24 hours. And my mother said every time the phone rang, she was just fearful that they were calling to let her know that I had indeed passed. I visited uh, about a year and a half earlier. I had visited the United Kingdom. I had the pleasure of uh, spending about a week in Scotland and about a week in England, in uh, London, and had a wonderful time. But somewhere in the process of all that, I contracted a parasite. And this parasite affects your intestines, and it builds up a wall on the inside of your intestine so that... Uh, food does not digest and for a year and a half I was so sick and it kept getting worse and worse and worse and uh, I could eat and within minutes the food just came out of me the same way it went in um, it literally came out chewed you know that's as much digestion as it went through and so uh, it was a very difficult year year and a half I kept praying, asking the Lord to heal me, and it wasn't happening. And finally, I told my mother uh, a few months before my birthday in 2000, I said, Mom, I'm not certain I'm going to see my 35th birthday. And she said, oh, don't say that. You know, I said, well, honestly, I'm not sure. I said, I've been praying and praying for the Lord to touch me, and He has not as of yet, he has not chosen to touch me, so I'm not sure that maybe this isn't uh, my going home, that I'm not on the landing strip for glory. And uh, so I, you know, I was honestly very much prepared to die. And so that year I had been living in uh, New York City for the decade of the 90s, and I decided it probably was best for me to move out of New York City and move back to my home state of Connecticut, uh, which, you know, by train from New York City, it's only about two hours. And so I decided I'd move back home. I said, this way, if anything happens to me, uh, my family won't have to retrieve my body from New York. And, you know, uh, my family... Uh, all come from the rural parts of Connecticut and New York City about scared them to death. So I said, if anybody had to go to New York to identify my body or pick me up or what, you know, I said, man, they're not going to like that very well. It's going to be hard on them. So I thought, well, I'll make it easier on them and I'll move back to Connecticut. Uh, a gentleman I knew in Connecticut had asked me if I ever left New York City uh, for any reason. Um, if uh, I would be willing to go back to Connecticut where he lived and start a work. And so when I went back to Connecticut, although I was sick as a mule, I was not feeling well, things were getting worse and worse, I'd gotten very thin. 
I said, well, I, God called me to preach when I was eight years old, and I'm going to preach till I die or until Jesus comes one. I'm going to be faithful to my calling. So I contacted this fellow. I said, you ready to start a work? And we started an LGBT affirming work there in New Haven, Connecticut. And uh, that summer I went through three hospitalizations. Uh, one uh, lasting of almost two weeks and the other uh, two lasting a week. And uh, each time I was in the hospital, I made sure I was able to get out so that we could have church. We didn't have a lot of people. Had maybe half a dozen or so who uh, came. But I said, uh, I've got a church to care for. So I told the doctor, said, i got to get out of the hospital so I can preach. I don't have anybody to fill my spot. And they didn't like that. They didn't want to accommodate me. I said, well, the other option would be for me to sign out AMA. I wasn't playing games. I said, you know, I'm going to go preach. And so finally the doctor said, all right, all right. We'll take the, the IV out and uh, get it wrapped up where you can go uh, preach and then immediately come back and immediately they would hook me back up to the IV, you know, and I'd get back in my hospital bed. I did that three times during the summer of 2000. And then finally, toward the end of August, um, I became so sick that I went to my doctor. I couldn't breathe. I was having trouble breathing. And I went to my doctor's office and they took me across the street to Yellow Haven Hospital, did a chest x-ray. Before they could even send me over there, they had to put me on oxygen. And uh, uh, my, my blood oxygen saturation level was very low. And uh, brought me back to the doctor's office. And when he finally came in the room, uh, he said, Charles, you may not like this. He said, you're probably not going to like this. And I said, well, you make it sound so dire. And he said, it is. He said, you may die. He said, we may not be able to save you. He said, you have uh, pneumonia in both lungs. He said, to be honest with you, you've got so much fluid in your lungs. He said, I cannot for the life of me figure out how you're even able to sit here and talk to me right now. He said, we have to hospitalize you again. So they rushed me across the street to Yellow Haven Hospital, admitted me, and I don't know exactly how long it was, but I doubt it was an hour, and I was unconscious. And when I came to, days had passed. My mother and my stepfather were there beside my bed. They were uh, all the way up from Texas, and um, it kind of surprised me, obviously, you know. And... Uh, uh, things were dire. They were bad. And I was extremely ill. I cannot even describe to you folks <clears throat> the level of weakness that I was experiencing. I cannot even describe to you how emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, and physically just wiped out I was. I was just completely... Honestly, I didn't have a scrap of fight left in me for nothing. I was just exhausted. And uh, I've told this story before, but I'm going to tell it again. And there's a reason, there's a method to my madness. First of all, because I feel like God wants me to share it. Uh, but there's a, a method. So I was laying, one day I was laying in my hospital bed, and I heard the voice of the Lord, and I know it was God. And the Lord spoke to me and said, do you want to stay here or do you want to come home? And I was so tired and I was so worn out that all I wanted was to go to glory. All I wanted was to go to heaven. And I said, Lord, I am so tired. I said, please, just take me home. I just want to go home. And I literally began to feel my spirit, my soul rise from my body. And I felt the separation. I literally felt like I was entirely, completely separated from everything physical. 
And I cannot describe the lightness, the weightlessness that I felt. I can't even describe it. It was the most amazing sensation that I've ever felt in my life. But more than this, I felt no fear, I felt no anxiety, I felt not one ounce of negative emotion whatsoever. It was just, I was at peace, I was, I was so calm, I felt uh, absolutely just de de detached from everything in this life. I wasn't thinking about my family, I wasn't thinking about my friends. I wasn't thinking about anybody or anything. I was just free. And then all of a sudden, out of the clear blue sky, a thought entered my mind, as it were, about the church that we had started and the fellows there. And I thought, Lord, there's nobody to take my place. There's nobody who's going to rush in to do the work that I've been doing now at that point. I'd been in affirming ministry at that point for about seven years. And I said, Lord, there's nobody going to rush in and do the work that I'm doing. And uh, I thought, I can't go. I need to stay. And when I thought that, immediately it was as if somebody put 30 or 40 bags of cement on my chest and I felt my, my spirit literally just fall back into my body. That's the only way I can describe it. It fell back into my body as if it were weighted. And boy, I'm telling you, it hit with a thump. I, 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 I can't even describe it, folks. I literally felt like this jolt when I was secured back in my body. And I remember trying to move my hand at that point. And I thought, dear God, how long has my hand weighed that much, you know? All of a sudden, I was so keenly aware of how heavy our bodies are, and how, you know, how heavy everything is, and how much effort it really takes just to move, you know? And uh, so I was still sick as a mule. I, I, God didn't heal me. I was still sick as a mule. And then a while later, maybe a day or two later, the voice of the Lord come to me and he asked me the same question. I'm not going to go through the whole story, but uh, same question, same answer. Lord, I'm tired. I just want to go home. I begin to rise. Same exact thing. I thought about the church and about the work I was doing and, and I changed my mind and my, I felt back into my body. The same thud, the same heaviness, whole experience identical. And after it happened the second time, uh, the voice of the Lord come to me immediately after that. He said to me, the next time I ask you, you had better know your answer because there will be no turning back. And so I lay there in that bed and I began to think about this whole experience. And I said, now God just said to me, the next time I ask you, you better know your answer because there'll be no turning back. And then all of a sudden it dawned on me. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. The Lord just told me that this whole thing is up to me whether I live or die. The Lord just told me that I'm the one making this decision whether I'm going to stay here or I'm going to go on. And it, it finally hit me. And then I said, the only reason I keep coming, that I keep changing my mind those two times is because of the church and the LGBT affirming work that I'm doing and how important I know it is and how there's, there's not a lot of people doing this and there's nobody that's going to rush in and take my place and blah, 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 blah. And I begin to think, and all of a sudden, my thought process turned to how important the ministry was that I was doing. That's all I could think about was because that was the deciding factor, you know, in my coming back. And as I began to think about how important the work was that I was doing, I realized, I said, I can't go anywhere. I've got to stay. I've got a work to do. You know, God called me to do something. Now, here I am, sick as a mule. Here I am in need of a miracle, right? I couldn't even imagine myself well and healthy. 
and normal, so to speak, again. And yet at the same time, the, the ministry I was doing, it finally dawned on me how important this work was. And I, I made up my mind. I said, Lord, I need to stay. I have to stay. And then immediately I heard the Holy Ghost speak to me. It was immediately. And he said, you shall not die. He said, you shall not die, but you shall live. Oh, I'll never, if I'm covered with chills right now, just thinking about it. I'll never forget it as long as I live. And my mother came to see me. And all I had was a, a pad of paper and crayons. Because they, they, when you're on life support, they can't trust you to have a pen or a pencil. Af afraid you might stab yourself, you know. Uh, either by accident or what have you, but anyway. So with the crayon, I wrote on the paper, I said, I'm going to live. And my mother had somehow figured out how to read my chicken scratch because it was awful. And uh, she looked at me, she said, how do you know? And I wrote on the paper, God told me. <laughs> well, it was 22 years ago tomorrow. The doctors had all come in. The nurses, a whole bunch of uh, people from the hospital came into my room with a little cupcake and they sang happy birthday to me. Couldn't, obviously couldn't put a candle on it because there was oxygen in the room. They'd have lit us all up like a torch. But they had a little cake, you know, and they sang happy birthday to me and everybody was real sweet. And I was alert enough to, to know what was going on. And then my mother came in a little while later. She had an envelope from Brother Ronnie Pig. Those of you that know the LGBT affirming Pentecostal movement, uh, you know Brother Ronnie. And he had sent me a prayer cloth from his church in Arizona, Casa de Cristo. And um, his people and he had gotten around a, a prayer cloth and they'd anointed it with all and prayed over it believing God for a miracle for me. He wrote me a real sweet letter saying, Brother, we need you in this movement. You can't go anywhere. We need you. And so uh, my mother had to open the envelope. I was too weak to tear a FedEx envelope open, literally. And my mom opened the envelope. I reached in when I felt, I felt the hanky, and I knew immediately what it was. I knew what they had done. And immediately, even before I took it out of the package, I was thinking, well, Lord, these people are believing you for a miracle because you don't send a prayer cloth unless you're believing God for a miracle. And I said, these people are believing you for a miracle. I said, I'll be hanged if I'm going to make you look like a liar. I said, Lord, uh, let's get it done. That was the thought that went through my mind because I was intubated through the mouth. And I said, Lord, let's get it done. And folks... The next day, they took me off life support after being on life support for almost a month or about a month. It debated through the throat. They had tried to take it off a week and a half, two weeks earlier, and I nearly drowned. Uh, they had to put it right back in again through the mouth. And uh, this time they took it out, and I was able to support my own breathing. From that day until this, I just improved and got better and better and began to mend. Oh, I want to tell you, folks, I shared all that story to tell you that God knew, the Lord knew, that the whole reason I wanted to live was the ministry that I'm doing. That was the whole reason. I did not have a love interest in my life at the time. I wasn't dating anybody. It wasn't family. It wasn't friends. It wasn't what I owned or any of that sort of thing. Had None of that had anything to do with my making up my mind that I wanted to be here. <clears throat> it was strictly the ministry. It was strictly the work that I'm doing. There's a lot of people in our community who look my way and they they may think this is a joke they may think this is a game well you can think whatever you want to think all i know is i'm alive 22 years after i wasn't supposed to be and the only reason that i'm here is because of what i'm doing right now that's how important this is to me 
And um, I take my calling extremely seriously. The reason I take my calling as seriously as I do, a couple of reasons. One, I grew up the old time way in the old time Pentecostal tradition, the old time Pentecostal movement where calling was essential to any man or woman engaging in ministry. If God didn't call you, then you'd be a fool to try to enter into ministry. Unless God has called you, you have no business in the universe standing in a pulpit. You are an intruder. You are an invader. You are a trespasser behind the sacred desk. If God himself has not called you to that office, ministry is not a profession. It is not a choice that you make. I was about eight years old or so when the Lord called me, and I've told this story before too, but Sister Joyce Starr was uh, one of the members of the church I grew up in, and she was teaching the Sunday school class that I was in. And she was going around the class one Sunday asking all us kids, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to be when you grow up? That was the question. What do you want to be? And when she got to me, she said, Chuck, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I looked at her and just as seriously as anybody could look at her and I said, I don't want to be anything. I said, I have to preach. And Sister Star said, she said, my God, she said, I felt like somebody took a big old barrel of oil, warm oil, and poured it over my head. She said, as that boy said those words, she said, my God, I felt the anointing of the Holy Ghost come over my body. She said, it was the most incredible thing. She said, I knew this guy ain't kidding. He, God's called him. And so she told my mother after church, she said, when you get home, she said, I want you to do me a favor. She said, ask your son what he wants to be when he grows up. And my mother was a little perplexed, you know. And Sister Star said, just do it. Just take my word for it. Just ask him. So we get home and my mother says, Sister Star kind of asked me to ask you something. She said, I'm not sure why. She said, but what do you want to be when you grow up? And I looked at my mother and I said, Mom, I said, I don't want to be anything. I said, I have to preach. God called me to preach. And my mother said she felt that same sensation come over her. She said it's like somebody just opened up a bucket of hot oil and poured it over her head. And it just ran down her. She said, whoo, I could feel the presence of the Lord come over me. That was God confirming that this kid wasn't playing games. I was serious. Listen, there is no less perfect human being on this planet than me. I wish to God I had grown up like so many other preachers. I wish I had grown up with a Holy Ghost filled tongue talking daddy who preached and a mother who shouted and ran the aisles and you know all that kind of fun stuff. That was not my experience. I grew up with an unsaved father. I grew up with a mother who struggled to try to maintain sanity, never mind victory because my father was an abusive narcissist who could make anybody crazy. And my father used to come against my faith constantly, constantly. He ridiculed uh, my faith in God. He ridiculed everything about God. And I mean, I grew up in, a, in an environment of constant uh, bombardment and being barraged, and my faith was under attack 24-7. I've got a brother today who's trying to walk the walk of an, of an agnostic, you know, or an atheist. And it, sometimes he'd say things to me, just ditch, you know, at God and faith and the Lord and what have you. And I told him not too long ago, I told him, I said, listen, um, I grew up in an environment with Dad and Dad pulled this garbage on me all the time. 
I said, so if you think anything you're saying is new to me, if you think anything you're saying is something I haven't heard before, I said, I got news for you. You're wrong. I said, I also got news for you. If you think I can't survive it and get through it and move past it, I said, you're wrong. I said, all this garbage you're throwing at me doesn't mean nothing to me. My God is real to me. I said, if it wasn't for my walk with God, I'd probably be dead or I'd have killed dad or something would have, something bad would have happened. Because that man was, my father was evil. He was, he was as demonic as Donald Trump times 10. And my brother looked at me, because he knows how my father was. And my brother actually looked at me and he said, you know what? He said, I understand that. He said, I get that. And he's really calmed down in the way he approaches things. Because he knows, you know, he knows what I went through. He knows what I grew up with. I'm as imperfect as they come. Every day of my life, I have demons to battle. I have uh, issues that I have to deal with uh, that date back to my earliest youth. I'm probably as insecure a person as you've ever met. You say, well, preacher, I don't see that when I listen to you on, online. Well, <laughs> thank God for being able to project, you know, things. Uh, but I, you know, I'm not, uh, I, I'm not somebody who's full of self-righteousness and somebody who's full of uh, an overabundance of self-confidence. Um, I take my calling seriously because I know it was a calling. And why God would call me, of all the people on the planet, to preach His wonderful message, I will never know. I'll never understand it. Because there's a whole lot of people out there, in my opinion, who are a whole lot better qualified and who can live this thing better and do this thing better than I can. But all I know is He did. And if he did, and I know he did, then you'd better believe I'm going to take this thing seriously. And that it's not a game to me. Because God has entrusted me, the last person in the world, that I would ever dream of calling to such a, 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 a work. He's entrusted me with this work. And you better know I'm going to take it seriously. So when I get up here and preach on Sunday, folks, uh, I'm preaching and I'm doing the work that I'm doing and it's not strictly for LGBT people but it has a very <sighs> purposeful outreach to LGBT people because as a member of that community myself I know the struggle of trying to reconcile our faith with our uh, our identity as a member of the LGBT community. I know that most people in our community who have found their way back to some semblance of a walk with God, some semblance of a relationship with God, some semblance of fellowship within His church, uh, every one of us it was not a matter of, quote-unquote, choosing a message that just, you know, uh, approved of our lifestyle. Oh, it's the most idiotic thing anybody could ever say. No, every one of us had to go through a battle. We had to fight our way through in order to reconcile our faith with our identity. And I know that struggle. And my mission in this life is to help as many uh, LGBT believers find their way back to God, help uh, LGBT people who have never known the Lord find Him, because so many churches today don't even include them in their message in a positive and constructive and biblical way. And at the same time, my job is to help every believer, whether you're straight, gay, cross-eyed, or bow-legged, every believer to find a deeper walk with God and to uh, establish their faith because we are headed into the end of days and things are only going to get rougher from here. And that means we have to be as empowered as we can possibly be 
and our faith has to be as strong and, and as secure as it can possibly be. And that is my mission, and that is my purpose, and that is why I do what I do. Amen. All right, I wanted to share that with you as we're coming up on my birthday tomorrow. Amen. I'll be 57. And I'm grateful for every year the Lord has given me. So far, it is 22 more than anybody ever dreamed I'd have. And uh, if the Lord gives me 22 or 44 more years, I hope to preach this message until the day I die or until the day the Lord comes. Uh, you know, I've known a lot of preachers in my life who have retired at a certain age and you know they left pastoral ministry and I can't even imagine retiring from ministry to me that's insanity because like brother uh, 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 Tatlock Warren Tatlock the year that I came out and he didn't know my circumstance you know but I happened to go by my grandparents' house, and Brother Tatlock had come over, and uh, he asked me, he said, So, Chuck, where are you preaching now? And, of course, I was feeling bad because I'd come out, and I wasn't preaching, and I was out of church and everything, you know. But I didn't want to tell him all that. So I just said, Well, Brother Tatlock, I'm, I'm not preaching. Right now, I'm, I'm not preaching. And he looked at me, and he said, did the Lord call you to preach? And if there's anything in this life I've been sure of, it's my calling. So I looked at him and I said, well, yeah, yeah, he did. And then Brother Tatlock, his only Brother Tatlock could do. He had, he had a way of saying things in three words that would knock you over. He really did, I'm telling you. And he looked at me and said, when did he tell you to stop? Boy, I'm telling you, you could have hit me in the head with a cement block and it wouldn't have hurt me as much as those words did. Those words just hit me, you know, pow. When did he tell you to stop? So uh, some preachers, you know, they look forward, I guess, to uh, retirement. Now, I'm not saying, Booby, that ministry, my ministry would at some point won't change and that I wouldn't maybe... The Lord wouldn't call me to give up pastoral ministry. But even if I'm not pastoring and I'm 90 years old, I'm still going to preach. Amen. Because that's what the Lord called me to do. Praise the name of the Lord. Continue.